Coming up on our newscast tonight. President Moon Jae-in invites leaders of small and mid-sized businesses at the nation's top office. The session is held to discuss a broad range of topics with the invited entrepreneurs. Ahead of another round of inter-Korean talks, a team comprised of officials from Seoul's Unification and Culture Ministries, as well as the Olympics Organizing Committee, is formed. Their role to provide needed assistance to North Korean delegates taking part in the upcoming Winter Games. Top diplomats from around the world gather for a summit in Canada. Although North Korea issues are central topics, China and Russia are not taking part in the event. New Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from Arirang Tower in Seoul. I'm Daniel Che. You're tuned in to Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. President Moon Jae-in is meeting with the country's small and mid-sized business leaders on this Tuesday evening, having invited them to the top office for dinner and discussions. Our chief Chongwade correspondent, Moon Gon Young, is live from the top office. Gon Young, so this time it's the leaders of the smaller firms in the nation. Absolutely, Daniel. Now, a dinner event here at the Blue House isn't so much of a rare event anymore. We've seen and this president host a beer night with the nation's biggest businesses and conglomerates. And also, we've seen him invite uh, labor unions, hardline labor unions, for dinner here at the Blue House. So it had left a big question mark in the minds of many when Mr. Moon failed to meet with the nation's leaders of small and medium-sized businesses and startups and venture firms as uh, considering his policy is focused on in supporting and nurturing these smaller mom and pop stores and smaller businesses and venture firms. Now, that's because of the many setbacks in naming the minister for the newly created ministry for SMEs and startups. Now that the dust has been settled there, the uh, pro younger, smaller firms president has managed to arrange this gathering on this uh, Tuesday evening. Now, the event kicked off with a huge cheering uh, ceremony for the Winter Olympics here in Pyeongchang, South Korea next month over cake, customized cake, made by a local bakery in the nearby uh, neighboring Incheon city, and followed by dinner. Now, the menu selection is, is key in, in witnessing what the message, what the primary message is from the president to these businesses. It's a Korean traditional eel dish that's well known for re-energizing your body and your spirit. Daniel. Certainly looked like they have a festive mood over there. Nonetheless, I'm sure these business leaders had their own concerns and complaints for the president regarding government policies and the business culture in Korea in general. Absolutely. Um, this, these talks actually come at a very interesting and, and critical time as these businesses, smaller firms, have been raising their voice over concerns that the recent administration's uh, re latest policy over the minimum wage raise um, will dampen and hamper their economic profitability as they're directly exposed to employees who are beneficiaries of this minimum wage increase. So so to that, the president acknowledged their concerns, and this is what he had to say. Listen. The president acknowledged their concerns, and this is what he had to say. Listen. The president acknowledged their concerns, and this is So the president did outline a couple of other measures to support and, and finance and support these, uh, these small and medium-sized businesses. But uh, these, none of them were new. They were actually ones that have been outlined by this administration before. And we'll have to wait and see whether it has satisfied, the meeting today has satisfied the, the leaders of smaller firms, venture uh, startup firms and venture firms. And we will see the results later in the night as the dinner talks are still ongoing. And I'll make sure we have more updates for you in our later newscast. Daniel. All right, Kanyang, thank you for being out there for us. We appreciate it.
Staying at the nation's top office, President Moon held a cabinet meeting earlier today. Among other things, he called for the government to be more innovative when making policy that affects people's lives. Hwang Wojun has the highlights from that session. More effective and more transparent. These were the two things the South Korean president said the government needs to be in order to improve the Korean people's lives. 2018년도 국정 목표는 국민의 삶이 더 나아지게 만드는 것입니다. 이 변화의 시작은 정부부터 좋아지는 것입니다. 정부가 확 바뀌고 있다는 것을 국민들이 체감할 수 있는 정부 혁신이 필요합니다. In Tuesday's cabinet meeting, President Moon ordered all public institutions to publish transparent financial and business reports and to make all data apart from personal information open to the public. He also stressed that all the government's work needs to be centered around social values and should contribute to the public interest and the development of the community. Such efforts would include breaking the glass ceiling for women working in the government. President Moon said the government needs to work to increase the ratio of female officials in management level government posts to 10 percent by the year 2022 from the current 6.1 and 20 percent from the current 10.5 percent for public organizations. The president also addressed the concerns of some who say the recent hike in the nation's minimum wage will put pressure on small businesses and cause layoffs, once again explaining the rationale behind raising workers' pay. However, he also asked his cabinet to come up with follow-up measures to quell the concerns and mitigate the potential downsides of higher wages. Many other issues were discussed during Tuesday's cabinet meeting, including efforts to accelerate earthquake proofing at all school facilities by the year 2029, five years ahead of schedule. And while he didn't give specifics, President Moon voiced his stance on the recent controversy over possible government measures against cryptocurrency trading, where the opinions of government ministries have appeared to conflict. President Moon said it's natural, even desirable, for each ministry to have and push for its own view but insisted those views won't be made public before the government takes them into account and reaches a final decision. Hwang Wojun, Arirang News. Seoul launched a special team to assist Pyongyang delegates that will visit the South for the Olympics. And for them to cross the land border, the government is also to coordinate with the UN command. Oh jung updates us on the developments ahead of the third round of inter-Korean talks scheduled for Wednesday. South Korea launched a support team on Tuesday to help the North Korean delegates who will be visiting South Korea for the Olympics. It consists of some 20 officials from the Unification and Culture Ministries and the PyeongChang Olympics Organizing Committee, who worked together at the Office of Inter-Korean Dialogue to promote and support the activities of the North Korean delegates. We will make sure related ministries cooperate closely on practical matters so that the PyeongChang Olympics become the Olympics of Peace. The government says the team's support for the North Korean delegates will be in accordance with the international regulations and the agreement reached by the two Koreas at recent meetings. And most importantly, the forms of support won't violate any international sanctions against Pyongyang. Seoul is also expected to work with the United Nations Command to enable North Korean delegates make their trip to the south through the land border. The North delegation had said on Monday that the 140 members of its Samjian Orchestra who will be performing in the south will cross through the truce village of Panmunjom, over which the UNC has jurisdiction. For such a large number of people, walking through the land border is much less uncomfortable than going by sea or air and it would promote inter-Korean cooperation on the military level, too. Performing artists coming through the land border may prompt other delegates to take the same route, but I think they'll actually come at different times since the purpose of their visit is different. The two Koreas are due to meet on Wednesday for the third round of talks, which will deal with more details of the North's role in the Olympics. The talks will be held at 10 a.m. South Korea time at the Peace House in the southern side of Panmunjom. The North is sending Chun jong su who is the vice chairman of its Inter-Korean Affairs Agency, along with the vice minister of sports and another person who might be a journalist. 
South Korea is sending its vice minister for unification, Chun Hae-sung, along with one official each from the prime minister's office and the Olympics organizing committee. Oh jung Arirang News. North Korea's Samjian Orchestra will be playing at the Winter Olympics, named after the northeast county of Samjian, which the state propaganda purports as the late leader Kim Jong-il's birthplace and as the sacred grounds of the regime's revolutionary activities. Other than these facts, not much else is known about this performing group. Each one brings us some experts' views on their participation. After Monday's inter-Korean talks, the two Koreas have agreed to have Pyongyang's Samjian Orchestra participate and perform at next month's Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and even in the South capital's Seoul. The group, consisting of 140 members, is rather unknown compared to North Korea's other musicians and performing groups, such as the Boranbong Band. According to South Korea's Unification Ministry on Monday, the orchestra was formed in the late 2000s to perform for important guests visiting the North. While some are not certain about the connection between the Samjion Orchestra and the existing Samjion Band, which consists of 50 to 60 members mainly playing classical instruments, some say the orchestra is simply the band reorganized with some additional members. Any North Korean performing group is under the state control. Therefore, these groups are easily divided and put together depending on the occasion. And in order to keep the color and repertoire of the Sam Ji Yeon band while enhancing its performance, it seems like North Korea has added more performers to turn it into an orchestra. And as the Sam Ji Yeon band had been playing classical music, the expert projects the orchestra to perform the same genre and even play some pop songs in order to show that North Korea is globalized as it argues. Korean folk music has also been mentioned as one of the possible genres of music played at their concerts, as the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un highlighted that the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics could be an opportunity to show the Korean people's prestige during his New Year's speech. But some experts are skeptical of this less familiar North Korean performing group participating at the Winter Games. Hyun song the leader of one of North Korea's most popular and iconic propaganda bands, Moranbong, joined the inter-Korean talks on Monday. While this could be a way of boosting the significance of the band within the reclusive state, we must also keep an eye on whether the Samjion Orchestra isn't made up of Moranbong band performers. As next month's performance will be the first such cultural event in over 15 years, experts say it could open more doors in the future but they also warn that it is something South Korea must carefully and thoroughly look over. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Seoul's foreign minister is in Vancouver for a summit that brings together the top diplomats from 20 nations. But according to our Kwon Jang Ho, fresh criticism from Russia, a country that's not attending the event, leaves further questions about the meeting's agenda. South Korea's Foreign Minister Kang Kyung Hwa arrived in Vancouver on Monday, where she was welcomed by her Canadian counterpart, Christia Freeland. She is one of the world's most seasoned diplomats, and I think South Korea and the world are lucky to have her as a foreign minister at this important time. I'm very happy to be here at this very important gathering and thanks uh, Canada and the United States for co-hosting this gathering. Seoul's foreign ministry said that the two discussed the next day's summit as well as the recent inter-Korean talks. Kang stressed Seoul will continue to work with Canada and the international community to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue, while Freeland expressed Canada's support of Seoul's efforts to achieve it in a peaceful and diplomatic manner. Tuesday's summit brings together 20 senior diplomats from around the world, including diplomats from the US, Britain, France and India. They're expected to call for continued international pressure on North Korea, despite Pyongyang reopening dialogue with Seoul on attending the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. An agreement to crack down on ships carrying out illegal trade of the regime in international waters is expected. But recent attempts by the U.S. to blacklist a number of vessels at the U.N. Security Council have faced opposition from China and Russia, who are not coming to Vancouver. The absence of these two key players in North Korean affairs has meant the meeting's credibility has been under fire, most notably from the two absent nations themselves. 
Moscow's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov at a press conference on Monday described the meeting as destructive and openly questioned the need for involving countries like Greece, Belgium and Colombia in the debate over North Korea. Beijing's foreign ministry previously said the summit would only create further divisions in the international community on the issue. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has defended the meeting, explaining that a diversity of approaches was important, but at the same time admitted that any resolution on North Korea would need to include China and Russia. Observers will be looking to see how far the so-called Vancouver Group will go to acknowledge the two countries' absence during the talks. Kwon Jiao, Arirang News. President Xi Jinping reportedly spoke on the phone with his American counterpart Donald Trump on Tuesday. The Chinese leader described the current easing of tensions on the Korean Peninsula as hard-earned that all parties need to continue working towards dialogue and negotiation. According to China's state broadcaster CCTV, Xi stressed that Beijing is willing to maintain close communication, mutual trust and respect with Washington and the international community in dealing with Pyongyang. He is also said to have commented on the positive progress in Washington-Beijing relations over the last year, that it brought benefits especially in the economic and trade sectors. The details of the call have yet to be confirmed by the White House. Meanwhile, U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, on his way to the Vancouver summit on Tuesday, reiterated that military options need to be made apparent as well to help reinforce diplomatic efforts. Back here in the nation, for the first time in 16 years, the Kostak has broken above the 900 mark. Korea's secondary stock index added about 9.6 points, or some one and a tenth percent, to close at 901. The index is heavy on tech and bio shares, which have been particularly strong, driven by spiking foreign investment. It's been hitting new records for weeks now, thanks in part to government efforts to boost investment and help innovative companies raise money. The Kazakh's market cap also rose to a new high Tuesday, now standing at over 300 billion U.S. dollars. The nation's finance chief clarified the government's stance on a number of highly contentious economic issues. In a recent interview, the minister touched on cryptocurrencies, housing market measures and the minimum wage. Kim Ji-yeon shares with us his remarks. Finance Minister Kim Dong-yeon first apologized for the confusion caused by the government's mixed signals on the nation's cryptocurrency market, but stressed that there is now broad consensus across the ministries that the overheated market needs tighter regulations. In an interview on Tuesday with local radio station TBS, Kim said that shutting down local cryptocurrency exchanges is still on the table, and related ministries are working together closely on a comprehensive set of measures. However, he admitted it's difficult as there's no globally accepted standard that could serve as a basis. He also acknowledged a blanket shutdown would cause massive financial losses for the millions of Koreans with money in the exchanges, as well as prompt people to shift their money into overseas exchanges or seek more covert transactions. Despite these risks, Kim claims highly speculative practices on cryptocurrency exchanges cannot be compared to the stock market and said regulations are needed to prevent crimes such as money laundering and market manipulation. The government seems to appear consistent when it comes to regulating the overheated cryptocurrency market. These signals would have a considerable impact in cooling down speculative forces. Despite his tough tone, the minister added that the government is keen to foster blockchain technologies, the backbone that powers cryptocurrencies, and are regarded as future tech that could play a leading role in helping Korea advance into the fourth industrial revolution. On the government's efforts to curb speculation in the housing market, Kim said it has been effective despite recent data showing price hikes in certain areas and added that property tax hikes for owners of multiple houses is a reasonable measure. The minister also defended the government's decision to sharply raise the minimum wage this year in response to criticism that it has caused more harm than good, particularly to small businesses. The Moon Jae-in administration hiked Korea's minimum wage to 7 U.S. dollars an hour for 2018, up by 16.4 percent from last year. Kim ji Arirang News. South Korea's anti-graft law has finally been revised. Most noticeable is the relaxed budget for agricultural gifts, but its actual impact remains to be seen. Yi jong yeon zooms in on the changes and their implications. 
adopted on September 28, 2016, the Anti-Graft Act was designed to reduce corruption and bribery in South Korea. Since its implementation, however, many people, especially in the agricultural sector, have strongly campaigned for its revision, arguing that it stunts demand for agricultural products. As a result, the South Korean government revised the law, with the changes to take effect from Wednesday. The limit to meals remains unchanged, but the limit for agricultural products has been increased to 100,000 won, or 94 U.S. dollars. The budget for cash gifts for weddings or funerals, on the other hand, has been reduced to 50,000 won, or 47 U.S. dollars, with the exception of wreaths or condolence flowers. But there's a special condition to the relaxed budget on agricultural products. It only applies to agricultural products or processed goods with more than 50 percent of agricultural content. This means the revision would not apply to goods such as ginseng juices with less than 50 percent ginseng. During the revision process, there have been concerns that it may encourage further relaxation of the limits, which would defeat the spirit of the law. However, pundits say this should not be the case. It takes the agricultural sector into account, but by decreasing the limit for cash gifts, which are more commonplace, it actually strengthens its purpose. Although the agricultural community acknowledges the government's efforts, the general opinion is that it is still not enough. Farmers are not satisfied with the revision. The problem is that there is still a possibility that demand will shift to cheaper imported products. So the revision itself doesn't do much to boost the agricultural sector. The expert adds that the revision does make a small difference, but that larger measures, such as the Chorus FTA, need to be revised to support the growth of the agricultural industry. Dong-yeon, Arirang News. Nearly 150,000 South Koreans have been out of work for six months or longer last year. The number of so-called long-term unemployed has been growing among the total jobless population in the nation. One Jong one breaks down the discouraging digits for us. The number of Koreans who have been looking for work for over six months hit a record high last year. According to Statistics Korea on Tuesday, the number of people unemployed for more than six months stood at around 147,000 last year, up more than 10 percent from a year earlier. The figure is the highest since records began in 2000, with even more people unemployed for over six months last year than during the 2008 global financial crisis when the number reached over 80,000. The current long-term unemployed population is continuing to rise, and this increase is likely to spread across the whole industry as the country's overall economic situation deteriorates. Those out of work for over six months account for 14.3 percent of the total unemployed last year, which is an even higher percentage than the 14.1 percent reached in 2000 during the aftermath of Korea's IMF crisis. Even more worrying is that this unemployment rate is particularly high among young people in Korea. The youth unemployment rate, which is the rate among people aged 15 to 29, also hit a record high of 9.9 percent last year. This young person who wished to remain anonymous said there is a lack of job opportunities for job seekers. I've been looking for a job for more than six months now, and when I listen to stories about my friends who are searching for jobs too, it seems that the number of competitors is ever-growing, but number of opportunities out there is not. Besides the lack of job opportunities, the reason behind the increase in long-term unemployment could also be that job seekers are looking for better quality jobs. My goal is to find a job that fits my qualifications and career. So I think that's why it's taking me longer than expected to find the right one. The proportion of unemployed who are long-term unemployed has nearly doubled from 7.5% in 2014 to 14.3% in 2017. And experts say that measures must be taken to combat this trend. There are three main ways for employers to help people who have been seeking for a job for more than six months. First, companies should invest more in diversifying human capital across their departments. Second, they should be more aware of the current unemployment situation. And third, they should cooperate with the government to come up with measures that tackle the current labor market. But as people from the younger generation are becoming more selective in their choice of work, unless the number of good quality jobs increases, this trend is likely to continue. Won Jong Won, Arirang News.
Time to turn to Michelle Bach at the Weather Center for the updates you'll need. Michelle, the government will be offering free public transportation again tomorrow during commuting hours or peak commuting hours to reduce vehicle emissions and also tackle the worsening air quality. That's right, Daniel. In fact, this will be the second time this emergency measure has been taken in Seoul. Now, the first time was earlier this week, and it takes effect when the average concentration of the fine does exceed 50 micrograms per cubic meter from midnight to 4 p.m., and when the next day is also expected to be at bad levels as well. So, I recommend that you use public transportation for your commute tomorrow and also wear masks. And currently, rain clouds are hovering over the southern regions, which will linger until tomorrow afternoon. But the capital regions will only see a light drizzle through the night. Now, Seoul will begin the dusty morning at 0 degrees Celsius, while Taegu and Busan hits 2 and 5 degrees. And the daily highs for Seoul will reach up to 7 degrees, while Gwangju and Busan both rises up to 10 degrees. Now, after the rain, the rest of the week will stay bright with similar highs. But starting Friday, we are expecting chillier mornings. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That's all we have for you in tonight's edition of Arirang News Center. As always, thank you for watching.